Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Samantha Oakley with ALA's Public Programs Office. I'm pleased to introduce today's webinar, Media Literacy for Adults, Meeting Patrons Where They Are. Before we start, I'd like to make a couple of notes about our virtual classroom. Only our presenters have microphone access, but you are welcome to type your questions in the Q&A box. To send a question, move your cursor towards the bottom of the Zoom window and click Q&A. Please also use the Q&A window to communicate any technical issues with ALA staff. Please do not put technical questions in the chat box as they could be easily missed if that window is very busy. We will respond to your technical questions as quickly as possible. Please note that this session will be recorded, so if you would like to review any of the information, you may do so via the archive version that will be available within 48 hours of this session. Today's webinar is presented by ALA's Public Programs Office as part of the Media Literacy Education in Libraries for Adult Audiences project, made possible in part by a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this webinar do not necessarily represent those of the Institute of Museum and Library Services or of ALA. As information providers and hubs for lifelong learning, libraries have always been resources for helping communities develop media literacy skills. Now, in the midst of a global pandemic and in an age when we increasingly rely on digital media for information and communication, these critical thinking skills are more important than ever. The Media Literacy Education in Libraries for Adult Audiences project is designed to support libraries in their efforts to improve media literacy skills of adults in their communities. By tapping the expertise of a diverse group of 30 thought leaders, this project has created a suite of free media literacy resources, including a practitioner's guide and series of six webinars. You can download a copy of the practitioner's guide for free at the link displayed on your screens. This 30 page guide contains information, program ideas and conversation starters to help you discuss media literacy concepts with your patrons. You can also register for the six part webinar series on programming librarian. This webinar today is the first in the series with the ones that follow covering topics such as misinformation and disinformation, which will explain how it is spread and how libraries can assist their patrons with identifying it. Architecture of the internet, which will discuss cookies, algorithms, and other parts of the internet that track your online presence. Civics, which explains how media affects our understanding and participation in our rights and duties as citizens. Media landscape, which discusses how to differentiate between different types of online media and how to build techniques to discern credibility. And finally, media creation and engagement, which will walk participants through how to help patrons discover their voices through media creation while also gaining awareness of their personal digital footprint. With that, I am pleased to introduce today's presenters for this session, Amber Conger and Kristen Calvert. Amber Conger has served as a library administrator since 2015, first as director of Kershaw County Library in Camden, South Carolina, and now as deputy director of Lexington County Library in Lexington, South Carolina. Amber was named the 2018 Outstanding Librarian by the South Carolina Library Association and received the University of Tennessee School of Information Sciences Alumni Innovators Award also in the same year. She was also selected as an emerging leader of ALA in 2014. Amber's professional interests include supporting the growth and leadership development of library colleagues and strengthening rural communities and libraries. Amber enjoys outdoor sports, traveling, volunteering, and living in sunny South Carolina with her cat, Cassie. Joining her is Kristen Calvert, who manages the Literature, Language, and Religion Division for Dallas Public Library in Texas. She works as public services manager, specifically with urban adult populations at the Eric Johnson Central Library. Kristen just finished opening the Story Center, a maker space that is designed to help people share their stories and disseminate information digitally. She holds an MLIS from Florida State University and a BS in advertising and business administration from the University of Florida. 
Kristen moved from Florida to Texas a little over a year ago with her cat, Bailey. Both Kristen and Bailey are living their best lives as Texans. And with that, I'll turn things over to Amber. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, clearly, we love our cats. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today presenting with Kristen on behalf of the ALA Public Programs Office. I've been involved with the Media Literacy Project for over a year, and it's been really exciting to be able to share our work with you now and to nudge the baby bird out of the proverbial nest and watch it fly. So here's an overview of what we'll be discussing today. I'll be starting us off with some background about media literacy, and we'll show you some research that will demonstrate exactly why media literacy skills are critical for us to work toward addressing with our patrons. In my presentation will have some interactive portions after we get past the first few slides. So be ready to jump into the chat with your answers so we can have some fun. Uh, after I share, Kristen will then be telling you about some ideas and techniques that she's found for integrating media literacy skills into your existing programs and services. So next slide, please. All right, so let's start off with the basics. What exactly is media literacy? There are many different definitions out there, but we like this one from the National Association for Media Literacy Education, also known as NOMLI. They define it as the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, create, and act using all forms of communication. So that's really broad, right? So let's break that down a bit. If we consider the traditional definition of literacy, what do we usually think of? reading, right? But what is it that we're actually doing when we read? When we read, literacy is the ability to encode and decode symbols in order to receive and analyze messages. So media literacy is that same ability, but it's applied beyond just the letters on the page of a book. When someone has media literacy skills, it means that they're capable of analyzing messages across all platforms. That includes electronic, digital, and print platforms. Someone can look at a website, a commercial, or a video, and they can be prompted to consider who created it and what that creator's intent is. So I would be remiss if I didn't point out that advocating for media literacy skills for our patrons, it's a nonpartisan effort. Nothing about this is pro-media or an anti-media movement. Nomly, the Media Literacy Education Association, it's a coalition of concerned people from many disciplines, like educators, faith-based groups, consumer groups, healthcare providers. Um, those are just some of the groups that have come together because they recognize the need of, for improvement and how we collectively understand media. Why are we talking about this now? Well, <laughs> we live in a media saturated society, as you all know, where absolutely anyone can create content and post it in our collective town square, which is the Internet. You know, it wasn't that long ago when we had fewer news sources and it was easier to determine where we were getting our information and what their motive was. But it's just it's not that simple anymore. And we can see the effects of people's inability to question the creator of a message and to question the creator's intent. Um, next slide, please. So now that we've defined what media literacy is, why exactly is it important? So I'd like for you to put your thoughts in the chat, but I'm gonna ask you all the question in reverse, okay? So tell me using the chat box, in what ways could a lack of media literacy skills have a negative impact on a person or a community? And I'll repeat that. In what ways could a lack of media literacy skills be harmful to a person or a community? So let's see what you think. And I'll give you a moment for the responses to roll in. And don't forget to, if you haven't adjusted it, to change it to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see. Mm -hmm. Scams, false information, <laughs> duped, paranoia, believing only things that confirm biases. Yeah, one of our future webinars will talk about um, filter bubbles. Okay, all right, so you all are right on target. Um, these are great responses. Uh, some things that I had thought about 
are an adverse effect on health. You know, right now we're all talking about COVID-19 and vaccines and the wrong information could cause someone to make choices, choices that could end up being deadly. Um, relationships, media literacy and relationships. What do you think about that? I mean, I don't know about you all, but it's really hard sometimes to talk with family and hear them angry and stressing out about something wacky that they read on Facebook that's not even true. Um, finances, I mean, there's so many landmines galore there. Um, believing poor financial advice, the effects of ads, phishing links. There are so many ways for people to lose money if they don't know to question what they're reading. And how many of you have been in the position of assisting a patron who is falling prey to a scam and you had to be the one to break it to them that what they were looking at was not legit? I saw a lot of this during my days at a reference desk. Um, and it was really hard and really sad. Um, another one that's on a lot of people's minds lately is civic and community engagement. Saw a lot of responses about that. Media literacy skills, they're simply essential to democracy. Um, these skills allow us to free our minds, make our own judgments and choices, and to express ourselves effectively. I mean, we could go on and on about this, but overall, yes, media literacy skills are essential to becoming a successful student, a competent consumer, responsible citizen, on and on. And if you're wondering why I put in a picture of a shopping cart, <laughs> I don't know if any of you were around for that Twitter discussion that went viral a few months ago when somebody had a theory about whether or not you returned a shopping cart to the corral as an indicator of whether or not you were a good person. Um, it was an interesting thought experiment, so um, you can Google it if you're curious about it. Uh, I like to think that having good media, liter media literacy skills is one of many factors in life that helps you grow into becoming the type of conscientious, responsible, and empathetic person who puts a shopping cart back. And maybe that's a bit of a stretch. I don't know. But maybe when you see a shopping cart, it will remind you to continue to integrate media literacy in your programs. So uh, let's move on. Next slide, please. All right. Um, so there's a lot of ways that I could show you that we have room to improve on the media literacy front. Um, for example, we could compare news articles for bias. Uh, we could test ourselves to see if we can tell the difference between a real Twitter user and a fake account from Russia. And if you're interested in that, you can do that at spotthetroll.org. It's fascinating. Um, spotthetroll.org. But let's take a look at this angle of media literacy connecting the news sources our patrons use with the amount of accurate knowledge they actually have. I pulled this data from a Pew Research study conducted last year, so it's timely. Um, so look at these news formats and tell me in the chat, from where do you think the majority of adults in our country receive their political news? Um, and to clarify, um, cable TV, that's CNN, Fox News, and so on, Local TV is your hometown six o'clock or 11 o'clock broadcast. Network is NBC Nightly News and so on. Um, so what do you think is most popular? All right. I'm seeing lots and lots of social media and cable TV, almost. Okay, some network TV. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you all. Let's go, good points from everybody. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. This is actually what came out from the survey from the Pew Research Center. Um, you can see the news website or app actually had a quarter, 25% US adults receive their political news from online, from news articles. Um, Social media is right up there though, um, just as y'all expected, 18%. And keep in mind, this is 18 all the way up to the end. <laughs> so we still have a lot of people that aren't on social media just yet. Um, the three TVs come next, radio and print. Ooh, print is way down there. And um, I guess 1% don't care. So, all right, let's, let's go on to the next slide, please. So let's, let's break this down even farther. Um, 18 to 29 year olds, tell me in the chat, which format would you say is most popular, most frequently used? I'll give you just a second.
Okay, I'm seeing mostly social media and a few looks like news websites coming in second. Okay. All right, um, 30 to 49 year olds. Let's switch to 30 to 49 year olds now. Which format would you say? It's a lot of social medias, news websites. Mm -hmm. Got some votes for cable TV. <laughs> All right, um, okay, we'll hold that thought. The 50 to 64 year olds, let's move to that group. 50 to 64 year olds, which one would you think they use the most? Lots of votes for cable TV, radio and local, newspapers, social media. All right, lots more variety there. Okay, print, a lot of votes for print. Okay, and then the 65 plus crowd. Which format would you think for those those people? It looks like uh, a lot of local TV, a lot of cable TV, and a lot of print. All right, so let's see where we are with that. Um, okay, um, here is the survey says, uh, those who get political news from social media from different age groups. So ages 18 to 29, you are absolutely right. Um, social media is by far and away um, the most frequently consulted medium for news. Um, let me see here. News apps and sites are second. That's about what you guys said. 30 to 49 year olds, we rely on websites. I'm in that group um, with news sites. Let's see, news websites or apps, social media comes in second, and radio comes in third. Uh, 50 to 64, they've got the greatest variety there. Um, they're kind of all over the place um, with a lot of local TV, network TV, cable TV. Those are our TV watchers. Um, and then 65 plus is still holding on to print. Um, then you've got your cable TV and then your network. Um, are there any trends here that aren't what y'all would have expected? I'm Southern, I say y'all, excuse me. Um, are there any trends here that aren't what you would have expected? Um, pop it in the chat, what do you think? Radio, um, yeah, I was surprised by radio's popularity among 30 to 49 year olds. And I, I wanna go back and look at that because I'm thinking that almost has to include podcasts. I'm not sure how that would be um, so strong otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that the 50 to 64 year old group had the most diversity in their format choices. Um, for me, I would have expected to see more social media use from them. Um, I, seems like I see a lot of people in that age group commenting on things. Um, but they're still, they're still watching TV. So, um, and then print news is steadily declining. Um, but generation by generation, down, down it goes. That's not a surprise, I think we knew that, but to see it laid out like this, um, it was a little jarring, I think. <laughs> so, all right, so let's go. Thank you all for your responses. Um, let's go to our next slide, please. Okay. Um, so now, this is where the rubber hits the road. Um, which users would you think demonstrate the most political knowledge and the least extensive political knowledge? Um, to give you a little backstory, they did a survey with um, specific fact-based questions just to see who actually knew uh, what was true and what was false about that. And so with these, we're wanting to see um, which users it actually, which users actually had um, the most accurate knowledge base. So tell me in the chat, which one's the most and which one's the least? Most print or news website, most cable, radio, we're seeing a lot. I see a lot of votes for least in social media. 
<laughs> this is a hard one. Um, The data was really interesting here. Okay. All right. So let's move on, please, Samantha. Okay. Survey says um, high political knowledge, news websites or app. Those users had the most, and most uh, radio came in second. Um, print actually went down to third. The TVs, ooh. Um, local TV, I was a little surprised at first, but then I realized that the people that tend to rely on local TV, your local stations typically don't cover a lot of national political news. So that makes sense. It's not that local TVs are providing misinformation. It's just that they don't cover all the same things. Um, and then social media is um, right down there towards the bottom, um, only 17% of those who rely on social media truly demonstrated a high level of political knowledge. 57% um, of those users had low. That is um, pretty significant numbers, I think. Um, so let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so what does this mean for us? Uh, how can we help? So the Pew study connecting media sources with political knowledge, it, confirms that media literacy skills are more important than ever. It's not just anecdotal that if you rely on social media for news that you're less informed. The statistics back it up. And this study shows that the trend of being less informed increases as the ages of our users decrease. Technology is changing daily and it's harder to keep up with it. It's easier to be deceived than it ever was before. So what can we do about that? How can libraries help? And I will now turn it over to Samantha to lead us into the next portion of our presentation. Great, thank you, Amber, for that excellent overview of uh, why media literacy is important, especially in the current uh, digital environment that we have. In this next section, Kristen Calvert will be discussing how libraries can combat the issues that Amber identified by integrating media literacy practices into existing programs and services. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to um, Kristen. Okay. Thank you, Samantha. And thank you, Amber, for that great setup and all of that wonderful information. Um, so how can we reach our customers? How can we integrate this into our interactions with our patrons? Um, as library workers, a huge part of what we do every day is meeting customers where they are and figuring out how to give them the information and tools that to meet their needs, even when they have a hard time telling us what their needs are. And as a part of putting together the practitioner's guide, information professionals and media literacy professionals came together. And one of the things we were tasked with was coming up with a definition of media literacy that we thought would work for us and for our customers. And one thing we found out very easily is how difficult it was for all of us to agree on that definition of media literacy, um, the one, and that's the one we gave you earlier. Um, we wanted something that encompassed everything we thought media literacy should be. And it also needed to make sense to the people we talk to every day. And, during this really intense conversation that we were having about this definition, it occurred to me that a lot of our customers and a lot of people in general don't realize that their media literacy skills are lacking. And the first person I thought of when I was thinking about this was my dad. Uh, my dad, he's a success successful middle class. He reads both sides of the story to get the whole picture. And um, him and I were talking about politics one day and that is never the best idea. Um, but he presented to me as fact, some specifics about uh, what immigrants get when they come to this country illegally. And I told him I didn't believe what he was saying was true. And he argued with me so adamantly. So I, I looked it up, I Googled it actually. I didn't even have to use my librarian skills here. I just did a Google search. And uh, it turned out that the facts that he were giving me was a, basically from a Facebook meme that had gained traction simply from people sharing it. And there was no evidential basis for any of it. So 
so, um, and I, I, I think like, again, with my dad, he would be somebody who says he, he gets his news from like reading news articles. Um, and like, he always tells me he reads both sides of things and things like that. So I think like people don't even realize that they get their news in these ways sometimes, which makes this more important for even more important for us. And, and we, right now we really do need to do this. I think, um, <clears throat> If, like if I were to tell my dad who thinks he's a savvy consumer of news that he is someone who needs this class, he wouldn't believe me. He would think it's a great offer, like a great opportunity for other people, but not for someone like he, like him. He, he knows where he, what media is and where it's coming from. And that's my point here. Um, we know already in the library, people often don't come to things that, um, that they need, even if they're things they know they need, but they're even less likely to come to something if they don't think they need it. Um, so I think that we can work on some strategies to incorporate teaching these skills to our customers um, because in our regular interactions with them. And I think in some ways this kind of challenges the way we traditionally provide information through reference interviews when we're speaking with patrons. But right now, especially election information, COVID-19 and vaccination information, our communities are being hard by the spread of misinformation and disinformation, and they don't have the tools to fight it. And they don't even know they don't have the tools they need. So we all saw it in real time play out last week. And it's becoming a harder problem to fight with alternate media sites like Parler gaining traction. It's important that people not only understand where their media is coming from and how it works, but why that's important. So let's talk about some ways like reference interviews, uh, programs, displays, and just teaching our others in our library systems and our partners about how, um, how to spot ha these harmful things and how we can bring it up to our customers. Next slide, please. Um, so first and foremost, at the desk, um, as you all know, the desk is often a place we informally teach, whether it's how to use a database or how to use a cell phone. Um, I remember I used to have a customer come up to the desk and she'd tell me she saw something online about like, I don't know, something the president did or, or something like that. And she'd end her statement or whatever opinion she was giving with, don't you think? And oftentimes I did not think or agree with what she was saying, but like any, any librarian, I held my tongue and I um, gave her whatever information she was requesting. I didn't want to engage in a political discussion with her. Um, and I made sure it was from a reliable source. And we all often have customers ask questions that could very easily lead to a discussion on religion, politics, or other slippery slope to topics. But having some tools related to media literacy in your back pocket is an excellent way to deflect and to create a teachable moment with your uh, patron. Instead of answering questions about hot button topics and you can ask questions like, where do you go for news? Or where, do you where did you find that information or hear that information? And that will, can open up the discussion to talk about sources and media and where it's coming from and why knowing that is important. Um, <clears throat> And I know like it feels like talking about these things can lead to a very opinionated or heated discussion and it's tiring, you know, it's, it's a fine line to walk, but having resources ready um, to avoid that discussion about ideology and to turn it back to media literacy is a really good school to have. Um, earlier, Mary shared a list of the resources we went over and I think that I'm sure it'll be shared again. Um, so just take note of those and uh, make sure you have them because they are a really good place to start along with the practitioner's guide and these webinars to um, have that foundation you need to have these conversations with your customers. Um, and I did wanna talk briefly about providing media literacy through phone and through virtual reference desk interactions because um, some of us, don't, probably don't have customers in our buildings right now. 
virtually it can be more difficult to get the point across and because we're lacking some of the cues provided by in-person communication. Um, you can't see the person or you're, if you're on the phone, you're only hearing them or with chat, it's even harder because you can't read voice inflections. Um, and that can make it harder to get to the bottom of what the customer is looking for. So just make sure that you're over communicating in these situations, make sure you're thorough um, and use the opportunity in chat to provide links and don't be afraid to suggest an email follow-up if you wanna provide more information than you can in the moment. And especially with a phone call, like if you can follow up with an email or that kind of communication um, and provide some different links to the resources that um, are available and benefit, you know, will benefit people and help teach them, do that. Um, but online or in person, teaching media liter literacy through informal customer interactions takes patience. And it's important, it's again, very important to have resources ready. Um, and make sure you have a thorough understanding of media literacy when you engage pat patrons. Uh, for instance, many folks who don't trust mainstream media think they have done all the research already. So you need to know why alternate media isn't a sound source before you engage. Our patrons are going to stop listening if they think we're attacking their beliefs rather than providing foundations in media literacy. The guide provides a great overview and I'd encourage you to start there and with the webinars we're teaching. So you'll have that firm foundation. And if you have the opportunity in, in school, like if you're in school for your library degree or for something else, take a media literacy class. <clears throat> okay, so I've got some example questions to go over um, how to answer at the reference desk to kind of informally engage customers. So the first question, please, next slide. How could anyone possibly vote for President Camacho? Um, Camacho is the president in the movie Idiocracy, played by Terry Crews, if you aren't familiar. Uh, but oftentimes customers approach us with politically inclined questions. And I think many times I've heard responses uh, from staff pretty similar to the first here. I've been hearing a lot about this. Would you like me to help you find some information on that subject? And that's a great um, librarianly response. It, uh, but it gives us, a we have a little bit of an opportunity here. We can show customers how we find the information and explain why they are quality sources over other sources. Um, so if we dig a little deeper, like with the second response, I can tell you feel strongly about this. Have you found specific outlets to help you shape your opinions? This, um, gives us an opportunity to see what cut sources customers are using and we can engage them in conversation about why they trust those sources. And it provides us an opportunity to give them some tools to learn more or with our final um, answer here. That's a good question. Have you seen this resource on the topic? Um, you may have to dive pretty deep into information like who funds media outlets, why it's important to check for sources on social media or even double check what site the link takes you to. And you, again, back this up with learning tools. Um, use the resources that we've got for you, both in the guide and the ones that um, have been shared in chat. And, and I encourage you to familiarize yourself with some of these and make a handout if you, um, if you can, or have a list handy so you can share that with your customers really quickly. Next slide. Okay, this is one of my favorites. Do you have any books on spiders? I'm concerned about one that may hide in my toilet seat and bites when you sit down. Look at this Facebook post. Um, do you guys, have, does anybody remember this spider from, from Facebook? Um, uh, or the post about him hiding in toilets? I remember seeing it and it almost got me. Like when we were putting this guide together, I thought about it. And um, one of my Facebook friends had shared it. It was one of my aunts actually. And uh, I started reading the post and thinking like, oh my God, that sounds awful. Like what a horrible thing to have to worry about a spider. Like, do I need to check? And um, now, and this was well before 2020 where something like that seemed, maybe now seems like something that wouldn't, <laughs> would, could possibly happen. Um, and more realistic than maybe um, it was then. 
So, um, but I, I, the more I looked at it, the more I was like, this just seems too insane to be true. And so I did a little bit of research and, um, and I noticed some of the things that you notice when something isn't based in fact, there was no source on it. Um, it looks kind of like stock photo-ish. So I looked it up online and saw that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a real thing on Snopes. Um, but this like this question is a good point because these things happen with small things like fake spiders, which I know isn't small to some people. Some people are very terrified of spiders, but also it happens with really, really big things that sway the way people think about politics or the census or pandemics. Um, so, so how do we answer questions like this and um, to kind of teach people a little bit about media literacy? Um, the answer on the screen. Let's take a look at that and try to find the source. Knowing the source might help us determine if it's biased or even false. That's a really, that's a really good way to start a conversation and to explain why, um, you know, some things might not be real and explain what is catching to you um, in these kind of situations. And uh, to give you another answer, there's a, there's a lot of different kinds of spiders out there. I'm not sure about any that live in your toilet. I can show you a couple websites where we can look up the validity of the content that regularly circulates the internet. And maybe we can look up something about spiders that might pop up in someone's household. So that gives you the librarian part of the response that like, I can give you some resources on spiders, but it also goes into the media literacy side of things where you're talking about um, validity of content and getting into that conversation with people. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> My child is spending a lot of time online and I'm concerned what they're looking at isn't representative of the values I want them to grow up with. Uh, when I was thinking about this question, my first inclination was to suggest ways the parents could um, kind of find out what their child was viewing or maybe set limits like uh, screen time limits or show them how like things like Netflix and Amazon Prime have it so you can, you know, have a specific account for children and set, um, set things like that up. So I wanted to provide resources to help the parent address the immediate need of like um, monitoring what their child is looking at to make sure it's in line with what they believe um, and have more control. Um, but answering the question in the way on the screen, with anyone in the world able to easily create and upload content to the internet, it's important for you and your child to understand where the content they are watching is coming from. Let's look at how you can learn and teach your child how, do you, how to evaluate what they are looking at online. Um, this kind of goes into the media literacy part of it a little bit more. It gives the par parent and the child the opportunity to come together and evaluate as well as I think create a better understanding of the internet um, between for the parent and for the child and both of them together as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving from um, the reference desk to programming, um, there are some really great and easy ways you can very casually add media literacy skills into your programming. Um, both in person and when you're doing online programming. We're going to go over some of these listed here in more detail. Um, and those that we don't go over, you can find more information in the guide that we put together. Um, but I just want to briefly mention tech classes here as there's not another slide on that area. Um, oftentimes we give tech classes in some kind of series um, that handles different topics in each class. So we'll do like how to use like something in Microsoft Office or the introduction to the internet or how to use email or how to use Facebook or something like that. And I just um, really think you should consider if you, if you have a series of classes like this, incorporating media literacy into this. Um, because you, basically when you show someone how to use the internet, you're giving your customers literally access to the world. And it's important to explain to them how easy it is for anyone to create content what's reliable and what their responsibility is if they're creating. And if you're teaching them to use Facebook, they're probably gonna become an information creator. 
So just make sure you're discussing trusted sources of information, best practices, and where to find quality information. Okay, next slide. So uh, book clubs, screenings, and discussions. I think these are the very obvious and um, easy ones to integrate media literacy into. If you're doing a book club, a movie screening, a program around like YouTube or TikTok or something like that, or even a video game program, um, you can steer the conversation towards media literacy really easily. Uh, in any kind of a special discussion, especially a book club or a movie discussion or uh, current events come up and just, you can discuss how the media portrays those events and why. And having some media literacy questions prepared and ready, they will come in handy when you have those dreaded lulls in your discussion. Those of you who run book clubs know what I'm talking about. It's that one or two minutes where nobody says anything and you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh my God, is nobody ever going to come to my program again? Are they not having fun? Well, Fortunately, having some media literacy questions ready will give you a really easy way to fill that topic and kind of, or that silence and kind of relate what you're saying to current events. Um, and have something ready to back this up um, and ha like having a handout or something like that ready so people can take it home never hurts. Um, and any of these will work online too if you're having these kind of programs online. And it gives you the opportunity to paste those resources right into the chat box, kind of like we're doing now. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, community celebrations and other types of events. These are the kinds of programs where you can get really creative and add some elements in that aren't traditionally uh, traditional to a discussion. Uh, you can find creative ways to put, partner with local journalists and bring them into your conversation. This will help broaden um, your customer's perspective and it will help broaden your perspectives too to speak with, uh, to speak with journalists about media literacy. Um, you can host a more traditional panel discussion or you can bring them into bigger events like some kind of community celebration or any kind of thing where you're meet, doing kind of a meet and greet with different partners so customers have the opportunity to learn more passively. And whether it's a panel discussion, an information talk or a virtual, uh, I'm sorry, a virtual convention or something like that, you can bring media literacy online as well. Um, we recently hosted an author in a virtual program who is also a reporter for a local media outlet. And it was a great opportunity to share about local history and the, the importance of media creation and just how like certain folks have an influence over the media. Next slide. Okay. <laughs> um, how many of you remember this commercial with the, with the lady who is posting pictures on her wall? And uh, she's like asking her friends to like them and stuff. This commercial like always cracked me up. Um, and I always thought it would make a really good library display. Like there has to be a great way to incorporate some kind of Facebook wall, like wall in your library as a display um, for something like this. And displays are a really great passive teaching just tool. You can create displays around a media concept and include materials and discuss that discuss media, media literacy, or you can include handouts and you can use a QR code um, if you don't want to spread, um, you know, spread germs or people touching things. Plus, I hear you need those to go out to eat right now. So it's a, it's a great way to teach people how to use them before they can venture out um, to dinner. Um, and you can also do this if you're creating displays for programs. You can provide additional resources during a program or include materials that discuss media literacy in that way. And again, there's a virtual opportunity here too. You can use your catalog to create a record set and link to that um, on your website or in a program um, or even through social media. Um, I also thought it would be kind of a fun idea to do like an escape room that involved um, online, like a virtual escape room that in, involved uh, media literacy concepts. Next slide. 
And of course, before library workers can effectively teach media skills to patrons, we have to have a solid grasp of the concepts uh, ourselves, which is why you're all here and why I know you're gonna go to the other webinars that we're hosting and we're gonna read the guide. Um, we have to know what it is and why it's important, but also, especially when teaching staff, it's really important um, to know the difference between information literacy and media literacy. Um, and again, we go through this in depth in the user's guide, um, but as information professionals, our work really has been focused on information science. And when we were working on putting all this together, I found myself having to like mentally transition myself to thinking about media literacy instead. So I just want to encourage you to make sure that's in your mind as you're going through this and what the differences are and really understanding them. And I feel like I've mentioned it like 300 times, but just make sure you're prepared, have resources ready, make a list of resources, make a handout. Um, and it's also important to talk about media literacy with your partners because you guys are representative of each other. Uh, with community partners, you can relate media literacy to whatever their area of interest is. And we often get these opportunities to share in their in board meetings or in, you know, like a, a program they might host or something like that. So it's a good way to an opportunity to um, include media literacy. And just to reiterate, like this is so important right now. Um, it's important for in individuals to become media literate and as information providers and the spot for lifelong learning. Libraries are essential in, in this, in this battle against misinformation and disinformation. And thank you all so much for listening. And um, I can turn it back over to Samantha now. Great. Uh, thank you to Kristen and Amber for that excellent presentation. We have about uh, 10 minutes uh, for Q&A. So I see that some of you have already been typing your questions in the Q&A box, just as a reminder so that we can uh, see the questions that people are posting amidst uh, the very active chat that we have going on. Um, please use the Q&A box to type, send your questions to us so that we don't miss them accidentally. Um, to access the Q&A, uh, move your cursor to the bottom of the window and click Q&A, and that should pop up that window. So um, it looks like some people have been upvoting questions, so I'll go ahead and read the first one, our top one. Uh, what if you offer a news resource that is reputable and the customer patron denounces it as fake news? Um. I think, I mean, yeah, this happens. Um, and it's, I think it's really challenging sometimes because like I said, of alt media sites and how convinced people are that mainstream media isn't trustworthy anymore. But there are a number of resources um, like the ones that we print, uh, sent the link to. Um, Normal has some great resources and tools that can be used, teaching tools that you can like kind of click through and show people like, where their information comes from and why that's important, who's creating it, and like if it's based in fact and stuff like that. So having some tools and just backing about like the general like foundations of media literacy should really help you here. Great, thanks Kristen. Um, so Anna is asking, how can we recommend news websites when so many reputable ones are blocked by paywalls? Is there anything a library can do to alleviate this? Um, I'll jump in. Can you all hear me? OK. Um, as much as you can, I mean, I know not every library can afford um, databases such as um, Newsbank and whatnot. Um, but if you know of a library that has a subscription, I have not been above calling them <laughs> and asking them to pull up an article. Um, it's hard. Uh, the paywalls, I mean, it, it's a real thing that we all deal with. And I just always try to work around it and find another source um, through the Associated Press or um, Reuters or um, one of the TV stations. I mean, Basically, just have to keep looking. I, I don't. I really don't know other than um, and you know the library paying for a subscription to the online version of the newspaper. Uh, 
Great. Um, so the next question we have is by Anonymous. Uh, where do you go to look for who funds websites? For example, how do I know who funds Snopes? Um, I, you know, I was just looking at this, like not for Snopes, but I was actually looking at for like NPR and NPR affiliate affiliates and how they're funded and how that's different than like, I don't know, NBC or ABC or something like that. Um, I just did a, like started with a search for it on just on the internet, like, um, you know, NPR funders. And then I found out that like, um, NPR gets a lot of its funding through affiliates. Um, and so then you have to look at who's funding the affiliates and how that kind of works with special interest and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, looking at different sites um, about us information or like kind of just through the terms, you just get, you just have to do a little bit of research and look into it and see, you know, um, and that it's a really valid and important question because um, telling somebody something's a reputable source, like they're trusting you with that. And a lot of time people trust us to know where that information is coming from. So doing that extra search to see um, and explaining to people why is, is a really good thing to do. Great. And this one, um, I'm unsure if you guys will have resources off the top of your head, but I'll ask just in case. Uh, so someone anonymous is wondering if you have any resources uh, that talks about digital editing of photos and uh, because there's a lot of concern with like photo fake outs that get posted on Facebook and things like that, that aren't real or pieced together post pieces of different photos. I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. Um, I imagine that some of the partners that we have worked with through this project um, probably have something, but I'm sorry, I can't think of any source right off on the top of my head, but um, I know it's gotta be out there. Um, Kristen, I don't know if you've, if you know of anything. I don't know anything specific to um, digital editing or like of photos or things like that. My first inclination, um, if somebody, you know, if I was thinking of something like that would still be like, um, depending on, you know, what it was, Snopes or um, Polyfax, I think they do address some of those kind of things. Um, but I don't know of anything that's specifically geared towards that. I will say in the chat, there's some ideas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> somebody had mentioned photo forensics, which I haven't heard of that, but that sounds exciting. Um, I definitely want to go play with that later. Um, yeah, Google image searches, um, you can always look and see, um, you know, are there comparisons out there that maybe start off looking a little different? Um, someone had mentioned news literacy project. Okay, great. This is great. I love learning from you all too. So yeah. I appreciate your input. I agree. Uh, there's been a lot of great resources being shared among uh, the various participants that are really useful and I'm looking forward to looking through all those. Um, so Kim is wondering if a good general rule is to refer patrons to sources on the library website first. Um, I, I think like I mean, yes, I know that we always try, try to use sources that we have that are available through the library because, um, you know, like somebody's done the work to make sure those are um, like reputable sources and things like that, like we're paying for them for a reason. Um, but some of these are free sources that are just readily available on the internet that are also good to use. Like if you're like, I'm, I don't know, I'm thinking of like Snopes or something specifically or like Nomal and some of their resources, like they're not, um, they're free for everyone to use because they want people to come to them and use them for these things too. So I think that you can look at both sides of that. Great, and I see some people have been upvoting um, some other questions. So uh, let's see, are libraries working with schools to share online resources like Techology from the News Literacy Project? I know that um, in my area that's, that schools are definitely talking about this. Um, 
I'm working with on the school improvement council of one local middle school. We're talking about cyber safety and media literacy is one of the aspects of that. Um, I don't I don't know exactly where where the pulse is um, for every school district, obviously. Um, but media literacy again, it's 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 absolutely critical um, to being an educated person. Um, I'm not aware of any one particular curriculum that they're all using. I imagine it's integrated across several subjects because it is multidisciplinary. Great. Um, and then do either of you have any um, examples of where someone can go to find good or current media literacy handouts that might be useful to use? Uh, no, I think like I just making one or creating one out of some of the sources that were given to you. Um, I think that depending on your community, there's going to be some sources that are specific to where you live also. So I think it's something that, um, you know, use what we the sources we've given you as a guide, a couple of the ones that are linked in the in the guide, the practitioners guide, um, have some really great infographics in them as well that you can use as a teaching tool so you can maybe get some things there to kind of start working on it um but i do think it has to be a little bit like specific to your community and I, I know that um the first phase of this project um there were five library systems that were chosen to receive media literacy training and then go back and implement those the training in their communities with programming and services. And um, if you're interested in looking at that, it's the learning and prototyping report that ALA produced uh, as part of the media literacy project. And one of those libraries is um, the Huntsville, um, Huntsville Madison County Public Library in Alabama. And they had created a libguide um, for public library patrons. Um, I would look there first. Great. And then it looks like someone is asking if uh, we can list all the resources uh, from the chat uh, that's been going by uh, for those who can't download it directly or uh, can't shift through all the uh, conversation that's been going on. Um, yes, we can uh, pull that out and add it to the resources and um, add that to the programminglibrarian.org page where you can also download a copy of the uh, webinar as well as the PowerPoint from today and the resources that my colleagues have been sharing. Um, and with that, it looks like we are at about time. So I'm actually going to close the Q&A. Um, and I just want to thank Kristen and Amber for this excellent presentation, as well as my colleagues behind the scenes, uh, Mary Davis Fournier, Sarah Osman, and Hannah Arata for all their help throughout this session. And also to thank all of you uh, for attending today's presentation and our funders for making this possible through the Media Literacy Education and Libraries for Adult Audiences with support uh, by the Institute for Museum and Library Services. A link to this recording will be shared out with everyone uh, within 48 hours of the session. Thank you so much.